Dancing and singing in the rain. It stops raining. Whoa. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Beyond the Bay Live here, sponsored by the Bay Theater here in Sutton's Bay, Michigan. And it looks like it stopped raining. That's very good. Well, I'm Larry, and we're here tonight to talk about uh, the singing in the movie, uh, the, the movie Singing in the Rain. However, I've got this other slide up here. There we go, Singing in the Rain. And tonight, joining me, I'm Larry. And joining us tonight is also going to be Kevin. Kevin is an industry insider, and he's also runs the blog, the top 10 film list.com. Uh, we also have Rita today. Rita is a programming team member with us at the Sutton's, at the Bay Theater in Sutton's Bay. And we also have Ted. And Ted Kroll is a uh, film historian who joins us with lots of years of experience. So we appreciate all the help we have here at the Sutton's Bay uh, and uh, the theater. So thank you very much, everybody, tonight. Join us that we're talking about singing in the rain. Uh, and to get started a little bit, we always start with a first question with our panelists to uh, kind of get an overview of what they feel about this film, just real significantly short, about why is this film and why will it stay in uh, film history? Let's first start with this one. Uh, Kevin, uh, I want you to give us a short, brief update on that. Well, as I mentioned in the introduction, which I, I hope everyone's seen that, um, for me, Singing in the Rain is the perfect musical. It balances comedy, romance, song, and dance in a simply a joyous um, story, joyously told, um, wonderfully performed, and I just think it, it just speaks to perfection. Um, it's one of those films I can watch over and over and over again find things that are new each time I see it. Um, and, and the final reason for me personally is sort of all of the inside baseball uh, type stuff with, with Hollywood history um, that really amuses me as well. So it's, it's perfection. Okay. Ted, your thoughts on this? Why will this film remain so long in history? I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not as big a fan as Kevin is, but that, <laughs> that's, that's my problem. Not, not, uh, <laughs> anyway, having said that, um, there's so much great stuff in this movie, I guess. Um, it, the, the stuff that um, Gene Kelly's dancing and then <clears throat> Don O'Connor's dancing, um, the songs, um, the orchestrations, and the bright colors. Um, it's, it's just, um, it's, a, it's, it's Hollywood doing what is on, going at full speed, doing what it can do. And the pacing of the film is great, and you know it's it's got an interesting story that keeps moving along. And there's no, um, it, 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 as soon as it kind of settles down a little bit, somebody pipes in with a song or starts dancing or something like that. So um, it, it just keeps you moving along like that. And um, and there's the the, uh, the the some of the humor is just um, very very. Uh, very, very, um, you know, when the, when they do that business with the sounds uh, and the microphone and all that, that that is a great gag, and then and, and, uh, I would appreciate that. So, so Rita, what do you think about why this film will remain in film history so significantly? Well, I think uh, Kevin and Ted have covered all the big things. I agree with them completely, and it's. I think I'd like to just add to that. It's it's a very joyous film. It's very um, easy to watch it over and over again because it has so many interesting layers to it. It's very well balanced between the dialogue sections and the singing and dancing sections. And I think the storyline is um, timeless enough that people throughout ger many generations can enjoy watching it and um, derive the joy from the story and the singing and the dancing. And as Kevin says, it's, it's a complete package. Everything is there in one film to appeal to many audience members. And of course, who doesn't want to go out, sing and dance in the rain, right? 
<laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Uh, so let's get started with the first question and welcome everybody who's here. I see some familiar faces and thank you, Scott, for that uh, comment on my costume. I appreciate that. <laughs> Is this a true period piece? Now, when we look at this film, it's supposed to be, it's filmed in the 50s, but it's supposed to be set in 1927. Is this a true period piece? Um, who'd like to begin? Kevin, we could start with you. Yeah, well, I look at um, sort of the, the idea of it being reflexive, right? It looks back at, at Hollywood. Um, so I don't know that it is a straight period piece because it's a satire about um, that bygone era when, when Hollywood shifted from, from silent to sound. Um, so I, I think Ted nailed it. It, it is timeless. Um, so I, I don't think it's truly a period piece. I think it just exists in time, but it, it, it certainly casts back to a, in another era, but not a period piece. Anybody else? Well, yeah, I mean, you, I've, I've been called the film historian here. And, and the fact of the matter is, I think one thing this film shows is that it shows how awkward it was that, that when they, they went into um, the change in, into sound. And to a certain extent, that's true. But in, but in other sense, I mean, this is why I'm saying it's not really a period piece, is that there were people that from immediately uh, directors that grabbed for the sound and did some uh, amazing um, sound, you know, use sound in, in amazing ways right away. So, it, it, you know, it, it wasn't as, um, as terrible a, a transition as it seemed. Um, but, but that whole idea, I think the, the one thing it does show is that the people were resistant to go ahead. And, and, and maybe the one thing it does say that was the success of the jazz singer. I mean, that is a, a historical piece that um, mm. they weren't quite expecting that to be the smash success that they expected. And so um, everybody had to go ahead and, and, and add the sound. And, you know, um, only in, in Japan, they didn't do it for like third 20 years or 10 years, they didn't add the sound. Um, but um, in every other part of the world, um, they, they, there was this obligation to fill in the, the blanks, and um, I, I, and it, it added a different dimension to filmmaking. Um, there were there were it, it added a whole bunch, but you know things weren't that bright and cheery. They weren't that colorful, and um, you know the, the, the hairstyles weren't that. It, it, it's a it, it, it's a musical. It's to, and it, it's mostly about the music. The the other interesting thing. And I guess we'll get into this later, though. But the songs, uh, most of the songs um, that came through on this thing were from that early sound period. Um, they did have some original songs in there, but they dragged a whole bunch of songs out of the, uh, you know, the, the, out of the MGM um, uh, vaults. And um, "Singing in the Rain" was a, a, in a film in 1930 or something like that. It certainly didn't have. Uh, Gene Kelly bouncing around in it. <laughs> it, it was a, I, I think one of the, the interesting things about that transition to sound is there wasn't just one technology that was in play. So if you're in this one, they talk about it be the sound being scratched on a record. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Fox was developing a magnetic strip on the film that evolved more into what we have had since then. So there were other films coming right behind this that had a complete soundtrack. I know this, they talk about, you know, the the you know they want music and they want um dialogue but really you know jazz singer only had what said maybe one scene of dialogue and the rest was a silent film uh, it was very little there was actually sound so this is actually sort of cheating history by leaping ahead a couple years from that transition because by 1930 musicals had exploded in hollywood and that was really one of the the first um, sort of the, the, the show stoppers um, when they added the musicals uh, above just the talking. Um, so it sort of cheats history in that in that regard too. So mm -hmm. that again, it, well, it, it I, plays with I'm it. I'm sorry, Reed, let me check here, but you know, the, the sound, uh, the silent era, the, the kind of rough and ready stuff they show in there, that, that apparently there, there was a lot of that. Um, mm -hmm. And they show about how the background was, uh, you know, was, was uh, cranked by and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> There were a bunch right. of uh, things they did in the sound era like that, and they did have the guys on the screen on the uh, making. You know, uh, Donald O'Connor is doing the piano playing, and mm -hmm. they, they did have orchestras playing while they were shooting the silent films. 
and the, and the director was yelling at the people what to do. So I mean, in that in that sense, it it it, it was I wouldn't say realistic, but it, it did depict what was going on. You know. Well, yeah. There's that that one scene scene where they're walking, and there's stage after stage after stage mm -hmm. lined up right on top of each other. Each one's shooting a completely different type of movie, but because they're silent, it, you know, you could pile them all on top of each other. So, so yeah, there's little bits like that 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 make it fun. Rita. Yes, yeah, so the guys covered a lot of topics right there in their answers. But I, back to the original question, is it a period piece? I would say no, because it isn't specifically true to one period. Um, as both Ted and Kevin mentioned, they did indicate um, happenings of that era of 1927 and how film technology was changing. But I think the film bounces around a lot, like between the... Um, the filming time and the the dueling cavaliers time it's not really a true period piece but it does look back with some fond nostalgia at that time to acknowledge all the changes that were going on in the film industry at the time and i want to add something too is that the last scene is the last shot you see is of the billboard singing in the rain it's like it's promoting the film within the film and so when this is looking at, if you go through the whole film and watch it through it, you're kind of feeling like you're being bounced back around in time. You're watching things that you think could be in the 50s, could be here, could be out, but it's it's just engaging you that much. And it is true, as Ted was saying, is that the songs were actually from that time period. If you, uh, Arthur Freed, who is the producer, executive producer on this, he is the one that actually wrote the lyrics for Singing in the Rain in 1929. He was a lyricist and would work with somebody else and they, they wrote music and a lot of the music, I don't, can't remember every piece is made from him. But Arthur Freed uh, became a producer, working a, a assistant producer, something like that, working with uh, Wizard of Oz. You see in this pictures collage up on the left, you see uh, uh, Judy Garland there sitting there because he worked there, then got promoted to do just focus for MGM on musicals. And he won two Oscars for producing uh, the uh, pictures in American in Paris and Gigi. In American in Paris, we're going to talk about later probably is how it relates to the effect of um, the reception and the viewing of how it all conflicted. But Arthur Freed was involved with all of this. And so when we look at this movie, it's using the, the music of the 20s, which he was really a part of, yet re inflecting a lot of the stuff that was in the 50s available to do and the styles and then even show the movie, like we're making this movie called Singing in the Rain. So I thought that was kind of interesting. It's not really a period piece, it's actually a satire or a reflection on the whole industry itself. Well, and it's Speaking funny because Wizard all, all these, oh, go ahead, Ted. Speaking of Wizard of Oz and Offer Freed, apparently he they were gonna cut out the Over the Rainbow because it was kind of a downer kind of thing. And it was Arthur Freed that insisted that over the over the rainbow be included and in and well the rest is uh, history you know <laughs> yeah the, the the funny thing is that so yeah free did write all of these with his uh, partner um, and I meant to write this down I think it was Brown um, and all of these ten of the twelve films that actually make the final cut of the movie um, were actually recycled from other films one of these um, titles was uh, in fifteen different films during the late twenties and early thirties so all of these songs at least their melodies and in, in most cases their lyrics too were used in other songs and the freed unit um that is as larry mentioned was and still is the the pinnacle of hollywood musical filmmaking um their string of hits and, and larry mentioned a, a couple of them you know american in paris is a is another one um but their list from 1939 to you know the mid 50s was un paralleled in, in the greatness of what they created. And it was a really small unit. It was essentially um, Vincent Minnelli, uh, Liza, I'm not Liza Minnelli, Vincent Minnelli, Judy Garland, uh, Gene Kelly. And then he had a, a sort of a, a boatload of uh, songwriters, lyricists, and um, and screenwriters that that really uh, crafted uh, all of the movies. Seen, you know, um scene guys making the scenery, set designers and costumers and all that stuff. You know? Yes, yeah, it was a, it was an entity in and of itself under the MG umbrella, but they really <laughs> left them alone. So. And it was untouchable by the uh, MGM studios. They they know they just let it alone. Um, yeah, it was money making money. You know, yeah. people wanted musicals. Make them laugh though was original with um, singing in the rain. 
But. Correct. Yeah, yeah. It, that's a, a funny one because it's actually a ripoff of uh, Be a Clown by Cole mm -hmm. Porter that yes. um, Gene Kelly was in in oh, shoot, the, pirate. The, name? the Pirate. Correct. Yeah. And um, the day they were shooting it, um, Arthur Freed wanted to show off what, you know, the film that they were making. So he brought Irving Berlin onto the set and Irving Berlin sat down, listened and then he's listening to him, you know, sort of do the song to make him laugh. And then he started laughing and he said, that's be a clown. You rip that off. And Arthur Freed became indignant and embarrassed that he had, you know, come to show off. And then he sort of realized that, yeah, it is a ripoff of Cole Porter's uh, be a clown. And so he ushered Berlin off the set. The stage crew and the actors all knew they could sense that it was a blatant ripoff, but Arthur Freed never admitted it. But Cole Porter, to his credit, never once approached Freed that he had ripped off his, his yeah. song almost note for note and just let it slide. So that's graciousness on Cole Porter's part. <laughs> What's that? Who pays attention to the song? It's, it's, it's uh, <laughs> dancing yes. and activity is just so incredible with that. That's just, mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody, yeah. I think as a kid, I remember the flipping, walking up the wall and flipping over. And um, that was a big scene. Just the whole, this is one, as a kid, this one really, I was like, this is like, wow, this is really cool. And mm -hmm. what I like also is about the scene as we're seeing here from the song is when he's sitting on the couch with the uh, headless dummy. Mm -hmm. So you sit with the headless dummy is that it looks like the set is huge because they designed in place the painting behind to, for a long distance hallway to give this uh, the perspective of a bigger facility. And I think right there, it just doesn't look like a couch against the wall. It's actually looks like something standing out by itself. And I think this little this 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 musical number in a way it was composed. And if you watch it, how it's all choreographed with all the materials and then this, you know, he's, he's just dropping on the floor. Donald O'Connor's is dropping on the floor, getting up and, and changing his mouth around. Like when you look at his lips on this one picture over here, it looks like he's twisting his nose, but he's not. He can really twist his, twist his mouth to make it look like his nose is bent. So, well, well we, Donald we O'Connor was a, a vaudevillian. He started performing when he was 13 months old and oh, really? was born actually um, not directly off stage but essentially on the road in Chicago with his family doing vaudeville. So this is Donald O'Connor at his greatest. And all of this is sort of choreographed improv that he did. And they shot it one day and it was very exhausting, clearly everything that he does, but they had a problem with the sound ironically yeah. for a movie that uh, makes fun of that. So they had to come back and shoot it the next day. Well, um, Donald O'Connor was a three pack a day smoker. So doing what he did in that song and three packs of smokes a day, it wiped him out. So he came back, did it again like a trooper the next day, but then he needed a couple of days off afterwards to recuperate because it so <laughs> destroyed his breathing ability, um, wow. what the smokes did. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's uh, Donald O'Connor, it's brilliant. And a lot of people say, and then I'll, we can move on to this question here, that uh, Kelly was an egoist, but this song is purely Donald O'Connor. Mm -hmm. If you look at yeah. Kelly's films, this is one of the few times where he, that Kelly lets a co-star completely shine in doing everything and singing, dancing and performing. Um, and so it's a, it's a wonderful little tribute to Donald O'Connor. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's good. Cause I think I, you have to give him a, tri a tribute to Donald Connor for this, too, as you guys are saying, let's move on. We have a question from the audience from Scott. Hi, Scott. So what's your favorite song in the film? Rita. Sure. Um, I'm not going to go with one of the obvious songs. I'm going to go with uh, Moses supposes, <laughs> especially after having watched the film twice this weekend to prepare for this. Um, I think it's just the lyrics are really clear. I like the whole diction scene. And the way um, is made fun of, and the whole Moses supposes his toes are roses, um, just the rhythm of it. It's like you know, this is if I always, as a teacher, I always look at it and think, well, how would kids today react to seeing this? And when I see that Moses supposes song, it's like that's almost like rap rhythm. It's like I think kids would get into it, and plus, it's a funny tongue twister, and it's just silly. And so, I this is my new favorite song of the movie right now. 
if I watch the movie again, I might change my mind. But for, for today, it's Moses supposes his toes are roses. <laughs> it's, a, it's another original movie, original song in the movie, too. I think one of the two. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 So, Ted, what do you what's your favorite song in the film? Well, I'd have to say uh, make them laugh. I, I, I mean, I, I kept saying that you don't pay attention to the to the the the, um, the song so much as the activity, but um, the, the the lyrics are pretty cool. I mean, I like the lyrics to it too, um, and the, and the sentiment involved in that. Um, even though it is a rip off from um, you know I'm a clown or whatever the other one was, but um, not, I that's a showstopper, I think. Ted, I mean, um, Kevin, what do you think? What's your favorite song? I like uh, Good Morning uh, because it's one of those that gets stuck in my head and uh, can sing it endlessly. Uh, but I think it captures the joy and exuberance of the film. I think it's um, Debbie Reynolds' uh, high point in the film. Um, and I think her character, like I said in the introduction, sort of captures that innocent, that more innocent period uh, before the Depression, before World War II. And I think that song sums it up um, perfectly. Plus, it's a wonderful song for it to explain how um, three people spent the night together, but only innocently. So that's that's for the, that's for the, the uh, production code uh, as well. So it covers off many different things. You know, it, they were having sandwiches and milk. I, yes. Well, you know, so I, I better get to say what my favorite song in there, and I've always liked this song, and I just had it up here. As, as, is this song here? It's often forgotten. Is this one song where um, what's it called? Um, you belong. Uh, you were meant for oh, me. You, you were yes, meant for me. Like me. In this song here, we saw the. It's all focused on the Sid Sharice dance. You know all the drama and everything else. But here, you know Kelly goes into the stage, sets the setting, turns the lights on, so you can see the whole backstage how it all works. She's standing up like Juliet on top of a ladder. And he's down like Romeo talking to her. And then they're singing, he starts singing this song and they start dancing. And it's not a real, real lively dance, but it's a dance of fun. And when you look at this picture here, you know, like you're saying about Debbie Reynolds, she was just pure joy, just having the fun. And just, this was great, you know? And uh, so I, I like this song a lot. I've always liked that song. I just think it's kind of cool. But also the scene is so stand out to me because it kind of represents a lot of the different components of the movie. You know, the it's in the 50s, but it could be in the 70s, 27s, trying to show that. And I just think the lyricism, but also the dancing and the style of this is just very beautiful. So that's me. Well, it does that setting does foreshadow uh, the Broadway ballet as well mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the, the pinks and, and different colors. Because that yeah. color palette is completely different than the rest of the film for those two right. scenes. So it's, right. that's, that's so that's his true love. That's Don Lockhart's true love, not the creature, the citrus. What? I, what did I say? Gene Kelly's true Don Lock Lockwood, right? Yeah. What did I call him? Lockhart. Lockhart. Oh, that's, that's what. Because that's what I called him in the introduction. <laughs> yeah, I was listening just before enough, this. Yeah. yeah, that was. So yeah. before we move off of this question, though, I think uh, Scott and Sheila should um, type in what their favorite songs are from the film too, before we uh, get too far away from this question. <laughs> so yeah, cause the songs, I think everybody walks away and I think Rita made a good point. When you see it again, you start, you think about these other songs you forgot about. And right away when I saw this again, I hadn't seen this in years and probably not in, off outside of television. And to sit there, it was just like, it was like, coming back to these songs and the numbers and the little skits and the routines. And it was just like, it was really, really, well, it was really good to see that again. And we, well, I, that thing with the fiddle, the two fiddles, um, mm -hmm. Audville act with that. It's just like, it just, it, 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 it's just unbelievable. I mean, that the, the best dancing is with O'Connor and, um, and Kelly together. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's infectious. You know, we're gonna we're gonna do everything. The, all all the uh, stops are pulled at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's that's a whole another thing to talk about a little bit here, where we're talking about songs. Is this whole sequence with uh, uh, where Don Lockhart is going through his uh, background and everything else, and he's talking about growing up, and he and he shows that he's with uh, you know Cosmo and how they're doing all these things. And that's and then it that's just really good that that you said that with the violins because you can actually hear 
when they when one of the persons stops fiddling, that his fiddle's still playing because the orchestra's playing it. And you don't really care. It's just it just happens. It's just really fun. So yeah. You know, I this is me um in, in my kind of thinking, but in some ways this is this film's a documentary because it it shows what Gene Kelly and what these people can do with dancing and it it the genius of this film and why going back to the first question, um it, 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 it documents um, some incredible dancing that you just it just doesn't happen anymore. That it's the same kind of thing. I mean, what Kelly can do and, and singing in the rain that song is and and, and while it, it 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 it's a very much of a set piece. It's also a documentary of of, of his genius. I mean, and and, and um, of of what he can do. You know, and and. If it wasn't captured on film, it would be sort of this thing that, oh, remember Gene Kelly used to be able to do this. Well, here it is. Mm -hmm. You can see it, you know. Well, anyway. it's, the, it's the idea of the what, what he called, what he and Stanley Donan called the cine dance, which was like I mentioned in the introduction. They they take the typical stage-bound music musical numbers from, you know, stage musicals, and they add the element of the camera that can move. So it changes the space and the dynamic of everything they do. And it's, you can see it simply in movies like, uh, in songs like Good Morning, where they move from room to room and, you know, and is complicated as in the Broadway ballet, where they can keep that camera moving. And, and like I said, it, it adds emotion. And that was Kelly's whole idea that it, you have to, his musical numbers had to be something that you couldn't duplicate on a stage, um, you know, step for step. There was something different about him. And it was that, that camera movement that, that created the emotion with the dancers that I think separates what Kelly does to any other um, Hollywood, any music, film musical numbers. His are, oh, you can always tell a Gene Kelly choreographed song because they're just different. So, yeah. And so Scott did get back to, he said, make them laugh. He likes the song and the performance, like that. But then Sheila came back and says, "I say the title song." And a lot of people, when you ask them that, that's what they say is the title song. And uh, I, I, I think because even Scott came back, Sheila's right. <laughs> I can't make up my mind, and that's hard with this film. And uh, oh, I thought I had switched the uh, switched the hair. I guess I did. Sorry. Um, so, but anyways, the title song is still sticks in a lot of people's mind and just the whole dancing. Oh, I'm else. frozen. What? What? Am I frozen? Okay. Hello, hello, hello. No, you're okay, Ted. We hear you. Yep. We got you. All right, okay. so on to our next question here. Is the character of Lena Lamott based on an actress from the silent air? Well, well particular, I don't think. That, well, they say that broadly based on, a, on an actress named Mae Murray, who her was she was in um, was it the Merry Widow in 1925? She had a pretty decent um, silent career, but her career stopped dead um, once Talking Pictures came in. I don't think she quite had Lena Lamont's voice, but her voice wasn't up to snuff, as they say. So, <laughs> so her career did end. But really, um, Lena Lamont. And the performance, the, so the, the character, uh, Gene Hagen's character, is based on a, a Judy Holiday uh, Broadway film, a Broadway play and movie called Born Yesterday, um, where her, I think it's Billy, I want to say Billy Dove is the actor, is the character's name, and had that high, squeaky, and annoying voice. Um, and uh, Judy Holiday won an Academy Award for the performance. Um, ironically enough, Gene Hagen took over. Uh, on Broadway uh, for uh, Judy Holiday when she went to make the movie. So Jean Hagen based her performance at, on, of Lena Lamont on uh, on Judy Ke Judy Holiday's performance. And actually, they wanted Judy Kel Judy Holiday for Singing in the Rain, but uh, she was too expensive by then because she won the Oscar. So, mm -hmm. so yes and no based on a silent actor. And what we have we have this here is that Judy Hagen's performance, I think, is. Of the there's four leads and she's the only one that doesn't sing and dance, and she didn't talk like that normally. She went on to to didn't do a lot of movies. She died young, and but she did the first I think it was the first three years or she was for three years she was with Danny Thomas show, and then she was also in the Asphalt Jungle, which is I think Kevin's one of Kevin's favorite films, and uh, she was a lead against Sterling Hayden and Marilyn Monroe paid a smaller part in that, but her. 
she just to me just steals the show. Rita, do you do you want to say anything about that? Yes, I do. In my voice. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I especially watching it this time, having not seen the film in a long time and probably last time seeing it on television all chopped up. Um, it was interesting to me and I thought it was very clever on the part of the, the script and the director to keep the character, Lena Lamont, silent for so long. It's not until quite a ways into the film that we hear her voice for the first time and she's not even on screen the moment we hear her high-pitched screech. She's coming from the, behind the curtain somewhere, at, you know, as they're taking their bows at the premiere. And so um, I think it's interesting how I think a first time movie, a first time watcher might not realize that she's not been talking for the whole time. But those of us who've seen the film and I watch it over and over again, we know it's coming. You know, you're just waiting for that moment when, when her high pitched squeaky voice um, invades your eardrum. So I think she, that's very clever how that's set up for the audience. Yeah, and what it's good is that she does a lot of the emoting at the beginning of the movie, which is required of her during the side film. And it, it, she's just constantly making the faces and the rocks, and she just, without saying anything, and you know that she's a silent actress. And I just think, and the people would expect not to hear anything because she's doing all the, the way. But her, her character, just like when she's singing the song at the end uh, and doesn't realize that uh, they pulled the curtain up. And she's sitting there singing along and she it's just like acting it out like it was on her, you know, like in the silent film. I just think it was great. So well, Ted, any thoughts? I'm gonna throw in something here, and, and this is one of the reasons I I, I have my second thoughts about this film, is because it's, she's so such a caricature, and um she's made into the villain in some ways, but you know, she's also a, a, you know bu rebuked by by every by all the characters and I find that um, somewhat off-putting, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, you know, in Judy Holiday and and uh, Born Yesterday is actually the same kind of character, but you know she's got some depth to her, and with the the the, uh, the Gene Hagen um, in this movie is is always just it's a, it's a one note thing. It, there's no development in her character really, except to even make her even more and more of a caricature and and the. Mm -hmm. You know, she's totally uh, humiliated at the end. Um, anyway, that's that's my take, and and, and that's that's something um, I don't I don't think you'd get away with it today. Um, that, that that somebody would be called such a dumb, you know, oh she's dumb, and everybody's like shaking their head behind her. All that stuff. Yeah. Well, anyway. she she sort of had her revenge because um, Gene Hagen, I mean, because when they're doing the scene where Debbie Reynolds' character is looping. Lena Lamont's lines in the, the the Dancing Cavalier, it's actually Gene Hagen's voice that they ended up using for that. Okay. <laughs> so they, it, it's it's very, um, yeah. you know, circular, right? They're making fun of this, but they actually did it in the film. And actually the, this um, one of the songs that uh, um, Debbie Reynolds sings was also dubbed by another singer. So, yeah. um, they poked fun at what they did back then, but they did it themselves too by by looping different voices in um, mm -hmm. and dubbing things. So they weren't and pure. Speaking of silent actors, I think Debbie <laughs> Reynolds, um, you know, puts down Gene the Gene Kelly Gene Kelly character for being not an actor and you know doing pantomime. And and for those of us that really love silent films and silent silent film acting. Um, it's a it's a whole different ball game. I mean, it's it's it, they they did have to express um, mm -hmm. emotions through um, body and and expressions. And it, yes, it was exaggerated, but it was also a, a style. I mean, and and, and yeah. sometimes it is incredibly effective. Um, and and again, that, and the movie shows that to a certain. This movie shows that to a certain extent. That goes from the the stylized kind of acting into a more natural kind of acting. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I, I also think that this movie succeeds, just related to that before we go to the next question here, is that it succeeds because the troupe does a very good job acting through in all the roles. The troupe performs well together. They all are connected together. They're all working as a flow. And that's where Debbie Reynolds comes in. So because the question is, this made this film made Debbie Reynolds a star. And in this film, she's, she's playing a person who's discovered. And actually, she is being discovered in real life as Debbie Reynolds. 
to portray a movie. That's why at the end of the movie, she's standing with Grace Kelly looking at his poster, this billboard, and she's like 19 years old. And it's just like, holy cow, this is like a big thing. So did she enjoy making the movie? Rita? Um, well, from what I had read, it seemed like it was, it was difficult because it was her first or one of her near first big pictures and that um, Mr. Kelly was very exacting and demanding in, especially in the dance sequences. And she wasn't trained as a dancer. She was not a professional dancer. Um, so the little trivia bits that I had read so that it was, it was difficult. They had, she had to work really, really hard and it was sometimes discouraging to uh, not be up to Mr. Kelly's standards. But I think in the end, um, you don't see all those things. You don't see the behind the scene um, hard work. You just see the beautiful finished product. And so it's, it's, I think it's easy for us as viewers to think, wow, they had such a great time doing this. Um, but we don't always know the backstory because there's to make things look effortless, a lot of effort goes into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody yeah, else? They, yeah, they said when they were doing um, Good Morning, um, Kelly became more and more frustrated with um, Debbie Reynolds' uh, performance because she was missing uh, a couple steps. But instead of yelling at her, he would yell at Donald O'Connor uh, because he knew Donald O'Connor as a more seasoned, you know, vaudeville professional could handle it. So he only screamed at Donald O'Connor while they were making the thing, calling him stupid and, you know, all this stuff that he was incompetent and stuff. Kelly then realized that he was the one who was messing up the step, not um, Reynolds or Donald O'Connor. So he sheepishly started doing it the correct way. And after the song, after they finally had finished filming it, um, he went up to um, O'Connor and said, you know, I'm really sorry, but um, I had to do that because if I yell at her, we'll lose her and she'll start crying and we'll lose half a day uh, of filming. And he said, that's okay, Gene, you just do it again, I'll kick you in the balls. And that's how Donald <laughs> O'Connor and Gene Kelly settles their difference and he no longer uh picked on donald o'connor when they were working on songs so well uh, and i but the thing is when you look at the film especially these couple of ones from uh, uh good morning uh she just looked debbie reynolds looks like she's having a good time and i think it's really difficult like you say it's hard to know what's going on in the step but i think some of these things there it's coordinated so many things were coordinated it took so long to make these shot shoots uh and some of these sequences uh but uh, she looks like she has a good time, and but it's hard. They said it was hard for her to get through this to the point because if you're taking somebody without experience in dancing, not really a singer, known as a singer, but she's a stage actor. And I want to say something too is that I kind of think this is very similar to Emily Blunt, who played uh, Mary Poppins in Returns, played Mary Poppins. Uh, that director had said, I want to take somebody that can act and knows the part and knows the role and I'll teach them, we'll teach them the other things they need to know, the singing and the dancing. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did with Debbie Reynolds. And I think you'll see that from time to time where the directors are trying to find a person that can act and, you know, emote and do all that, mm -hmm. not just be singing and dancing. Mm -hmm. So, yes. I have a question yeah. from Kevin. This is directed by Donnan and Kelly together. How did they work together? Was it, do you, can you, I don't, I'm not, I haven't heard much about that. Uh, yeah, so they had a very interesting relationship. They they actually started working together on Cover Girl in I think forty two, which was uh, Gene Kelly was on loan out to Columbia Pictures to make a film with Rita Hayworth, and he brought Kelly in. I mean, brought um, Donnan in as an assistant uh, to Gene Kelly, essentially. So he helped with some of the choreography and, and things like that um, while they were making Cover Girl, and they clicked. They had a similar sensibility, so they started working together. I think in the late 40s, they may have directed On the Town, which was, I think may have been the first time they were co-direction uh, that they gave it to. But when they were, uh, Kelly always saw Donan as his son. You know, he's 12 years uh, younger than, than Kelly was, so he sort of treated him as a, as a son, as an inferior, um, which later they fell out because of that. Um, but making singing in the rain it's essentially donan had the eye behind the camera so he, he was very good like i talked about those cine dance how he could you could intuitively know where the camera needed to be when kelly was choreographing the songs so um he was more of the technical side of the filming 
Um, Kelly was everything in front of the camera and, and Donan did um, most of what was behind the camera. Um, so that, that's essentially how they, they work together. It was a very symbiotic relationship for a long time. Uh, so much so that Donan's first wife was uh, a student that Kelly had taught in Pittsburgh when she was a teenager and she came on and um, Donan ended up marrying her for two years, divorced her. Um, Donan was in love with Kelly's wife. Kelly ended up marrying this girl 10 years later that Donan had divorced. So it was all very incestuous and all very um, intimate. Um, but eventually they had a great falling out. And uh, what's that? Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, but anyway, it's a very long winded answer for um, they work together sim symbiotically for a short period of time incredibly well, but then had a falling out and, and really. And a dancer too, right? Donan, yes. Donan was a dancer. Not, not obviously not to, to Kelly's, um, uh, because if you go back and see um, the Alter Ego song from uh, the movie Escapes Me, um, Kelly or Donan actually mirrors Kelly um, before they they superimposed the double of Kelly on top of it. So, so yeah, he could dance, but just not 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 as good as Kelly. All right, White Fang, we have another question. Oh, there we go. How was the via, via veil dance accomplished? The veil was has a life of its own, but this was all before CGI. Mm. <laughs> uh, we we could get very intimate with this answer if, if, you, uh -huh. if you want to. <laughs> um, so as you saw in the, the shot you had before, they had airplane motors, so those big propellers that were oh, blowing propeller. that. Yeah, so the big things and uh, Sid Charisse had to be held up at some point because it was going to push her down. But the main problem was, as they were shooting that scene, the force of the wind um, made her very skimpy costume uh, even skimpier and would have moved Singing in the Rain to a an X rating um, because they couldn't solve that problem. So if you watch the film on Blu-ray, you can see it very plainly. They actually had to hand paint certain frames of that dance to make sure that um, Sid Charisse wasn't um, performing indecently. Um, and it's very obvious once you know it, you can just, I mean, not that you want to <laughs> focus on it, but it's very obvious that that's what they had to do. And they tried take after take after take. Imagine doing that, that song, take after take after take, but they could not solve the costume problem. So they said, forget it, we'll fix it in post-production, we'll just paint paint over it, and they did. And uh, But yes, it, it did have a life of its own, uh, and it was very troublesome, the whole the whole thing. So yeah. did they, did, was the veil projected only by the force of the fan, the wind for mm -hmm. the fans? Yes. So they didn't really have any control over its direction or its flow mm -hmm. at all? They, they controlled it all with the fans. So they had multiple fans around the stage, which you can imagine, you know, the force that one would create, but then they had multiple ones depending on where they wanted the fan to go. Obviously mm -hmm. they were all off camera and they could essentially make it go more or less where they, what they wanted it to do. Cause you can see it's very deliberate when it does free flow and shoot up to the, towards the, yeah. the sky. And then mm -hmm. when it stays low and it, it's very deliberate what they did with it, but it was, mm -hmm. yeah, all done very simply with, with yeah. fans. Because that, that dance, I think, is really stunning. It's really beautiful. But it, that's also the part of the dream sequence that's like the dream within a dream. And um, I've always felt that that dance is way too modern for a movie that's set in 1927. So that, that's one little thing that just has always bugged me a little bit when I've seen this. It's like, okay, this dance is really modern, but we're supposed to be in 1927. So it it's a it causes a little bit of dissonance, dissonance in my brain, but it is truly spectacular. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it's the um, yeah, because remember it, the, that that whole sequence opens with uh, Cosmo and and uh, Don um, telling RF this is going to be the big song and dance number, and it starts yeah. with one piece in the you know in the, in the club. Then it evolves into you know what's in Gene Kelly's mind, staring at Sid Charisse across mm -hmm. the the club. So I think it's like that. It's sort of like a, um, a Christopher Nolan film, right? It's just, it, it keeps winding down in, in, in itself um, in, into different layers. So mm. for me, that it's the one 
scene that I remember exactly where I was sitting the first time I saw Singing in the Rain. And it's because of that sequence, because it so jarred me uh, when I saw it, because it is so very different than anything else in the film. Mm -hmm. um, I'd never been a fan of musicals before then, so I'd seen very few. And when that 13 minute section dropped in, it just, it, I had hair then. So it blew my hair back, um, so to speak. But uh, So where were you? I, I, at an airport? I got the hair. Uh, <laughs> no, I was in a in a wow. film class in in college. It was it was very. There was no wind. It just you know, just happened. We were talking about Arthur Freed. Um, he was an art aficionado. Um, he he collected art, and the, the one thing I noticed in this scene is it it, it it's almost like a setting in a, a Salvador Dali film, with that kind of perspective going back, and yes. same with all the colors and and. Um, when we see the bandwagon, um, again, there'll be there's a sequence that's very much like this one um, that goes on for a while with Shidris and and, and uh, Fred Astaire, and it it also has some very um, non movie like um, scenes, um, you know, it's set, settings. Um, so we'll see that, but and, and then in American in Paris, they deliberately set some of the scenes to be. Um, different styles of, of impressionist paintings too. So, yeah. if we if if we want to talk about the auteur or the uh, the one that created, you could really look to Arthur Freed as somebody who um, would would do these kinds of scenes that were kind of uh, surrealistic and um, you know impressionistic and all kinds of things. And um, he added that kind of sophistication that you wouldn't expect um, in, in, in Hollywood. I mean. People in Hollywood had they were had very good high tastes, you know, and and part of the problem is they had to sell these movies, so that's why they couldn't do all the things they wanted to do. But in these sequences, these dancing, mm -hmm. they got away with murder. I mean, they got away with high high uh, tone that they wouldn't wouldn't be able to do just otherwise, you know. So and, and it really worked on Kevin. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I mean, here's uh, I could go on and on about the. Broadway ballet, I probably already have, but I think it's the, when Kelly has a dance partner that's equal to his abilities, it really takes everything that he does to another level. I mean, and it's no slight to, to Debbie Reynolds, but she's not a dancer. But if you look at his, that dance with um, Sid Charisse, mm -hmm. it's, it, it just shows the elegance, the grace, but the physicality mm -hmm. of, of Gene Kelly's dancing style that was very different and we'll talk about this, you know, when we talk about bandwagon and Fred Astaire. And they actually liked each other, Fred Astaire and, and uh, Gene Kelly. But their dancing styles were very different. I think that's the sort of the bridge. But when you see a good partner with him, um, I, I just watched a Cover Girl with uh, Rita Hayworth and him. And, and now she was a great dancer. And just to see them dance, it just elevates what Kelly does to a, a whole other level. So. Right. And we haven't even talked about the the main singing in the rain piece too, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, when he's so on, we have a next question here, too. White Fang. <laughs> Donald kind of plays such a great sidekick that Gene Kelly. Did Donald go on to go on to star in any starting roles? I don't know. He was uh, well, with Francis the Talking Mule. Yeah, he was, I mean, he was a B movie movies. actor um, before this. Um, I, I, I mean, I think he had a, a decent career. Not. Um, nothing to this level. I mean, I think this is the pinnacle of his mm -hmm. career, but I think he was always a good comedic sidekick uh, type actor. Um, very, very solid, but uh, nothing great. He actually, I think he only, he won the only award that, that Singing in the Rain won, which was a, um, I think he won it anyway, a, a Best Actor Golden Globe, strangely enough, um, for Singing in the Rain. Um, Maybe it was just nominated, but whatever. Uh, it's it's one of the, the, the you know the few things that uh, came out of the film award wise. So. Mm -hmm. All right. yeah, and as a sidekick, he has some of the best one liners and zingers throughout <laughs> mm -hmm. the film. Yeah, he, he's yeah. the one delivering all. Cosmo to uh, to assess the situation succinctly. And and the other interesting thing about singing in the rain, I understand it was not that big a hit, and part of the reason for that was because. Gene Kelly's uh, was in American in Paris. That was the the big musical of that year, and that was another Arthur Freed extravagant mm -hmm. kind of thing. So um, it it it's gained its reputation over the years and has overshadowed everything else 
uh, from that era. But um, it, it's it's interesting that in, in its day, it, it, I, I think it was recognized as a good film, but um, not not the iconic view that we have of it today. You know, All right, yeah, it was question. one of those one of those things. The um, Louis B. Mayer had left um, MGM, and a guy named Dory Sherry uh, took over. And when uh, an American in Paris won the best Oscar in you know February or March, whenever they gave it out, um, they just they put it back into theaters and they took all the money that they were going to spend promoting Singing in the Rain and they just dumped it into the re-promote of American in Paris. So it did get good reviews. It's just it was swallowed up um, by American in Paris, mm -hmm. which is a good. It's actually a great film. It's I just don't think it's as good. So mm -hmm. question, White Fang. The singing and the dance brings happy action in this movie. Has action, violence replaced singing and dancing in movies? Well, action. Well, action. You have the uh, the background of the people. You know, the actors today just don't have that. Um, you know, they don't come from the stage, and and then that's not as popular. Of course, they had La La Land, which is sort of a update of this movie in some ways. I mean, even though it has this kind of um, you know, sad ending and all that kind of thing. But there's that exuberance in color in LA and, and, and movies and all that kind of stuff that's, that's in it. But uh, I just don't think people are, uh, I, you know, the, there's another thing that struck me about this is TV was coming in right around the early fifties. Mm -hmm. So the bright colors made this, would bring people into the theater because we, we really realized that, <laughs> Um, there wasn't any color. You don't realize it was just black and white, you know, not even high definition, no, de no definition color. So people would come in to um, get a, a really good production and bright colors and all that kind of stuff. That's another factor in this. And, and I think people, it, it, it just doesn't have that appeal that, that, um, to, for the audiences now. Right. I also think that along with uh, Ted's thought about television coming in at this time, I think what happened almost simultaneously is a lot of the singing and dancing moved to television in the form of variety shows that people could watch at home. So there you got your singing and dancing fix, but singing and dancing moved away from the films. Um, and we really don't have, like aside from La La Land, um, there really aren't movie musicals that are made nowadays. And all the, the movement is, is portrayed in action sequences rather than in dance sequences. And both have to be choreographed very exactly in order to be good and to be safe. Um, but it's, it's, it's not the same satisfaction at the end of a dance sequence as the end of an action sequence. And I forget who the guy is in, in La La Land, but he's no Gene Kelly, that's for sure. Ryan, was that Ryan Reynolds? Ryan Gosling. Brian Gosling, yeah. Well, Ryan. If, you, if you look at some of the musicals that have been made, they're essentially stage-bound stage musicals. So Les Mis was out probably 10 or 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. Chicago was out in the early aughts. And, um, you know, sadly, that abomination that was called Cats, um, which was out a couple years ago. Dude, they're more stage-bound. So I think they, they lose the, in that transition to movies what Kelly and Donan, uh, you know, spent their careers uh, mm -hmm. advocating, which was this taking it out of the, the theater and making it something wholly unique to, uh, to, the, the, to the movie screen. Yeah. Back then, adults went to the movie theaters, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, More that. so than children. <laughs> <laughs> so Lena Lamont, another question here from White Fang. Thank you. Lena Lamont became very pushy and demanding toward the end of the film. Do actors really hold so much sway over studio bosses? Well, the, the I'll answer this real Rita? quick. The studio, the studio. Yeah, go ahead, Rita. You I, was just, um, I lost my thought. Go ahead, Kevin. It's gone for I'm, a I'm sorry. The um, I'm sorry. well, at this time in the, the studio system, right? The directors were just hired hands. The producers held all the the power, and as movie stars evolved and got bigger, um, they started to cause a ruckus, and that's essentially helped contribute to the. The, the studio system's demise and just one piece of it. Um, could they ever challenge a, uh, a uh, studio head like that? I don't think so. Um, some of the actors did, uh, Betty Davis did, and she ended up on suspension quite a bit at Warner Brothers. Barbara Stanwyck did. 
um, at Paramount and got herself into to trouble as well. Um, but they always seem to come out the other side just fine. But um, mm -hmm. other actors like Francis Farmer didn't and um, were essentially driven mad or had their careers destroyed uh, because they were they were too um they wanted too much independence from from the studio bosses so yeah. it could go either way yeah i will remember what i wanted to say i think that nowadays too there are many more legal teams involved on both sides handling all these little questions and making sure contracts are read and fulfilled and um eyes dotted and t's crossed so I think it adds this in this scene, um, it adds to the story and it of course pushes it to the 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 scene that we all like when you know the, the curtain goes up and we see uh, um, Kathy Selden singing behind the curtain. Um, but it does make you think, well, how much influence do the actors have? Because sometimes it seems that they're just pawns in the studio system. You know, you have to make this film because that's what your contract says. Right. I mean, they're called a movie factories or the dream factories. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really what was happening. I mean, I love that Raoul Walsh was a, a, a Warner Brothers director. He said he, he would learn what his next picture was. He would finish a picture. <laughs> and then on Monday morning, somebody would throw the next script on his, his, <laughs> at his door like a newspaper, you know. So, I mean, in some ways, mm -hmm. they were just trying to produce a product, you know. Mm -hmm. and. With Arthur Freed, he had this, we, we talked about it, it was his own little um, production company. And, he, and so everybody was pretty much happy working with him because uh, they had a steady job and, and, and they were working together um, and with the same people. On, and, and so um, these couple of movies were that he made in the 50s were just, just a different kind of a, a situation than that was mostly going on in Hollywood. And right around now too, as the actors started getting from percentage of the movies. James Stewart um, was the first one who got, what, 10% of one movie, and, and that just changed everything. Um, so. Yeah, so we're, at, we're running low on our time. We give our, ourselves about an hour to do this. And so uh, do we have our last question there? So when was the last time? This I want the audience to think about this, the same thing at this time right now. When was the last time you were singing and dancing in the rain? So, Kevin, why don't you tell us that? When was the last time you were singing Dancing in the Rain? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go uh, aggressive and say it was last summer. And I'm sure that I belted out Singing in the Rain because my kids and my wife enjoy uh, how much I sing and when I sing. So I'm sure that was it. And if you can't tell the sarcasm, uh, <laughs> I've got a bridge. <laughs> Rita, what about you? Um, I can remember a couple times I've been caught in the rain, but I don't think I, um, I think I'm far too serious a personality to, to sing and dance in the rain. Maybe I'll work on that in 2021. <laughs> Real yeah. quick, seeing that scene there, um, yeah. it, it just flows from one thing and it seems, it seems like all one take. Apparently it took them days to make that, mm -hmm. that thing. And that's, yeah. another, that's another brilliance of this movie is that sequence is just so great. And another thing I read about was that they had to worry about the water. They were pumping so much water into it, it was uh, draining the reservoir in, the, in, in Culver City, wherever it was. So they they had to time yes. that. People and, couldn't uh, water their lawns. Yeah. And I, I think like, it's I like tramping in the snow rather than singing. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer, Ted. Yeah, I just think so, it, because the thing is, singing and dancing in the rain, you sing a song, everybody sees it, everybody loves it. Kids go out naturally just to go out and dance and play in the puddles. I like to do that. You know, it's like when you're outside and it's raining, why not? You have a good time, and this song pops in my head, and it's a lot of fun. So as we go on here, we have to go uh, leave us now. We're getting close to our end time period, so thank you. And I want you to leave everybody thinking about when's the next time you're going to be going out is it going to be, are you going to go sing in the rain? And we want to thank everybody for coming today and uh, showing up with us. And we also want to remind everybody to please go and subscribe and turn on your notifications because that way you'll get updates when we're posting things out to our, our Bay Theater YouTube channel. And next week we have, uh, not next week, next two weeks from now, we have the bandwag at live online discussion here again with our panelists uh, on the bandwagon. And this, this film, the bandwagon, is similar 
into uh, what the movie we just talked about, Singing in the Rain. And that Singing in the Rain was all about movies and the making of the movies. And this, the bandwagon, is about making theater productions. So we're going to see the contrast between the similarities between the two. And Ted Kroll is going to be, yes, the, like in the song at the end. <laughs> and so the, as Ted is going to be doing a short introduction uh, or, uh, that's going to compare the two movies. And then Ted is also going to do an introduction and, uh, after that about this movie. So we hope you go and watch those introductions and Joyce two weeks from now. And please, next time it rains and it's warm enough, <laughs> please go outside and sing in the rain. Thank you, everybody. Have a good weekend. Be safe. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you, Sheila. Bye-bye.